So we've seen that if a randomization distribution looks approximately bell-shaped, it's reasonable to use a normal distribution to approximate it for finding a p-value. What we're going to investigate is how we could know without looking at something like a randomization distribution or better yet a sampling distribution if we have access to that whole population, how we could know without going through that process whether or not it's reasonable to use a normal distribution. So to do this we'll do a little bit of exploration and the first pair that we're going to look at here is n equals 20 and p equals 0.5 we're going to go to sampling distribution for a proportion and generate a sampling distribution and see what the shape approximately looks like. So in stat key, sampling distributions for a proportion, I will select n equals 20. And I want to make sure that my proportion, my population proportion is 0.5. Five. So I'll edit my, oops, sorry, edit proportion is what I want, not edit data. Edit proportion and enter 0.5. Now when I generate a thousand samples, I can see that this does look nicely bell-shaped. So I'm going to come back here and say yes for this particular pair. This activity is really written, intended to be done independently by students and then to come back and compare answers. So I do recommend that you pause the video right now and fill this all in yourself. I will go through it very quickly so that you can compare your answers to mine. So coming back to stat key, I still have a sample size of 20. I'm going to change my proportion to 0.1. generate a thousand samples and I can see that this doesn't quite look bell-shaped and what we can kind of see going on is that it, it almost appears as if it looks like it wants to be bell-shaped if it makes any sense at all to talk about a distribution in such a way like it wants to be bell-shaped but that over here on the left side it just gets cut off it didn't really have room to fit the whole distribution between 0 and 1 and so it's not bell-shaped. So we'd come back and say no. And then we try this again for 0.85. We have a similar problem, but this time on the right-hand side. So for this, we'll also answer no. Now I'm going to increase my sample size to 100. And I'm going to try all three of these same proportions again. So up here where it says n equals 20, I'm changing that to n equals 100, and I'll start again with 0.5. Nice bell-shaped distribution. When I edit that proportion and change it to 0.1, still looks like a pretty nice bell-shaped distribution. I'll generate a few more samples. It does kind of uh, correct for that little bit of skew that we were seeing. And I'll edit my proportion and enter 0.85 and see that, again, we do get a pretty nicely bell-shaped curve. This time I have to generate a few more thousand samples, it looks like, until it really smooths out. But all three of these are reasonable to answer yes. So, from these observations, we want to answer these questions. Is it necessary for the sample size to be large? Well, when the sample size is large, n equals 100 here, we did have all three of them as yes, but we also had a yes over here with n equals 20. So I would say, no, it's not necessary for the sample to be large, but it is helpful. So I would answer yes to this second question. If n is not very large, as we saw with n equals 20, what needs to be true of our proportion? Well, it worked well for 0.5, but it did not for 0.1 or for 
And so we could see from those graphs they kind of wanted to be bell-shaped, but they were pushed a little bit too far to the edges, close to zero or close to one. So if my sample is not large, I want to make sure that that proportion is close to center, so is close to 0.5. So that what I need for it to be reasonable to use a normal distribution is to have a proportion that's reasonably close to the center or a large sample size or at least the two to balance each other out well enough if they're not quite a large sample size and not quite close to the center. So there is a way it turns out to quantify that and the answer lies in these calculations right here n times p and n times 1 minus p. If we look at these and think about what happens, if n is large, then when I multiply it by p, it's not going to matter as much what p is, I'm still going to get a pretty large value. And if p is large, it's not going to matter as much what n is, when I multiply them together I'll get a fairly large value. Now we said we don't necessarily want p large, we want it close to center. So what happens if p is large like 0.9? that's where this second one comes in. If p is large, 1 minus p is small, so we need to make sure that both of these expressions are equal to at least 10, which has the effect of making you prefer scenarios in which p is close to center so that neither p nor 1 minus p will be too small. If that all didn't just make obvious sense to you, don't worry about it. We can calculate NP and N1 minus P for each of these combinations, and just doing the calculations helps it to really make sense. So in this first box, N is equal to 20, P is equal to 0.5, so when I calculate N times P, it's simply 20 times 0.5, which is exactly 10. And when I calculate 20, times 1 minus 0.5, well 1 minus 0.5 is also 0.5, so that one also comes out to be equal to 10. When p is equal to 0.1, I have n which is 20, multiplied by p which is 0.1, and this comes out to be 2. Then I have n which is 20, and 1 minus p which is 0.9 in this case, this comes out to be 18, and finally with 0.85, n times p is 20 times 0.85, which is 17. And then n, which is still 20, times 1 minus p, which is 0.15, this one comes out to be 3. So what we can see here is that where, n, where p was fairly large, like 0.85, NP was no problem, but N times 1 minus P didn't work out. Where P was very small, it was N times P that didn't make the cut. N times 1 minus P was fine over here, 20 times 0.9, but they both have to be greater than 10 for it to count. So that the only one of all of this so far that has really made it for us is this top one. Now let's do all of these calculations with n equals 100, right? 100 times 0.5 is 50. 100 times 0.1 is 10. 100 times 0.85 is 85. Then over on this side, 100 times 0.5 again is 50. 100 times 0.9 is 90. And 100 times 0.15 is 15. So over here, everything passed, right? Everything is greater than 10, so all of these work. And I'll make these just a little bit more obvious, this highlighting. So that this flag shape here represents the ones that pass the test. And if I look back up here again, I can see it was the exact same ones that passed our test when we were looking at the actual sampling distribution graphs to see if they looked bell-shaped.
So this criterion here, the NP and N times 1 minus P at least 10, is equivalent to what we did looking at those distributions. So all of this brings us to a very important theorem in statistics that all of or very much of distribution theoretic statistics is based on the central limit theorem which states this is a, a fairly vague form of the statement for random samples with a sufficiently large sample size the distribution of many common sample statistics can be approximated with a normal distribution and in particular this normal distribution centered at the null parameter and with standard deviation equal to the standard error of the statistic. Uh, the way that we define sufficiently large in the case of a proportion is by the criterion that we just established. NP and N times 1 minus P are both at least 10. The central limit theorem will come up again for sample means. It's not just a theorem that applies to sample proportions. It applies to many common sample statistics, but this is how we're seeing it for the first time.